let me share my screen. There you go. Um, one, th one thing that I like to do is I use the notes pages in uh, PowerPoint. Let me find that. There we go. So um, the advantage of notes pages is it gives you a view where it shows you what the slide is uh, that's being projected. And then you could write yourself notes of what you want to say uh, while, the, the, uh, while you're giving the talk. And if any of you would like to have that in addition to the um, video recording, just send me an email and I will send you a PDF file of the notes pages uh, that I hope I will remember to say everything that's on the notes pages, but in case I don't, uh, there's some useful information there too. So let me go to the presentation. Uh, and so uh, it, what I want to talk about is mainly how to write a statement of purpose for graduate school admissions. But for those, some of you who are younger, uh, I think you'll find this talk useful if you're having to write a statement uh, to uh, apply for an RU uh, summer program or to get an internship at a company. And I'm pretty informal when it comes to uh, giving talks. So if you have a question, just shout out um, and I'll try to answer it. Um, or you can put a question in the chat and Jamie, if you can monitor the chat for me, because I can't see the chat when I'm in presentation mode, uh, we'll try to answer all your questions. So your objective in writing a statement of purpose is to convince whoever's going to read it that you are a good investment. Um, one thing that some younger students don't realize is that most U.S. universities actually pay you to be a graduate student and get a PhD. And in physics, over the course of the, the five and a half to six and a half years that you study to get your PhD, a department will invest, it, will invest probably a quarter of a million dollars in, in your PhD program in terms of uh, the salary that they, they pay you, the uh, tuition that they waive, uh, no physics graduate students pay tuition, uh, and the, um, just the research infrastructure uh, that they provide for you. If, if you're an experimentalist and you break something, the university doesn't send you a bill for that $65,000 laser. Uh, and so, uh, for us in departments, one thing that, that we try to do when we offer admission uh, to, to a student is to make sure that you're going to be a good investment of that uh, quarter of a million dollars we're going to spend on you. Uh, and we hope that you'll go off and be fantastically successful and make a lot of money and give it back to us when you get old and philanthropic. So when a graduate admissions committee looks at a, an application or an REU committee looks at the stack of REU uh, applications, there are some things that they're specifically looking for. And the first one is that you have the, the skills and the experience and the motivation to be successful. Uh, nobody wants to admit a, a student to a graduate program and think that they're not going to persist and go all the way through to a PhD. A second thing that graduate admissions committees look for is that you understand that graduate school is different from undergrad school, that graduate school is about doing research and finding answers to questions that nobody knows the answer to. Um, so you want to, to convey that uh, you understand that, that a graduate degree is a research degree and that you have the 
attitude and aptitude and persistence and excitement about doing research and not just taking classes. And so the thing that you want to emphasize in your statement of purpose is not the classes you've taken or even really much your grades, but what you've done in research and why you're excited about that and, and how it's prepared you to be successful in doing research. And finally, you want to convey in your statement that you have the maturity to work on your own and you have the discipline to persist when the going gets tough. Research is hard and it's not a, a linear activity. It's ups and downs and things that don't work and stuff that breaks and uh, just intractable problems for a while until you figure out how a way around them. And you want to show that you have, have that attitude of mind that you're not going to get discouraged and quit. Uh, another important thing to think about in graduate applications is that one size does not fit all. Uh, each, each school that you apply to will have slightly different uh, instructions. They'll have uh, different um, resources that you might want to use in your um, in your uh, research. And so you have to tailor your application for each individual uh, school or program. Uh, the best way to do it is write sort of a general core document that describes your research experience and then customize it for each school that you're applying to to take advantage of what they offer, what, what professors you want to work with at that school, what special uh, facilities or infrastructure you might make use of uh, in your graduate program. And you really want to show the uh, graduate admissions committee that you've uh, done your homework and you've explored their department and you've explored the opportunities that they offer and you find that it, it fits very well with what you want to make out of your graduate studies. Um, for the students I had, had in Physics 496, they've heard me say this many times, but before you write anything, the first question you should ask yourself is, who's going to read this? Who's my audience? And for statements of purpose, internship applications, REU applications, the answer is your audience are either human resources professionals for companies or senior faculty if you're applying to a, a university program. Uh, and they, as a tribe, have read thousands of applications. Uh, and so you want to think about how are you going to sell yourself? What are you going, how are you going to interest them in you? Uh, what's going to make them read beyond your first paragraph? And how are you going to differentiate yourself from the other hundreds of applications that they're probably reading? For our department, last year we had 870 applications for graduate school uh, for about 45 slots. Uh, typically for our REU program, we get about 250 applications for 12 slots. So um, it's competitive and you have to make your statement be just as compelling and concise and interesting and distinctive as you can. The way I suggest people get started, and I will be the first to admit, your statement of purpose is probably going to be one of the hardest things you ever have to write. And so you want to do a lot of thinking ahead of time. So start out by asking yourself some questions and write down your answers to these questions in one concise, coherent sentence and then arrange your sentences to make an outline for what you want to write about. So here's the kinds of questions you should ask yourself. Uh, these are what I call sort of first order questions. What have I learned 
as an undergrad about physics and about myself. What do I enjoy doing? What do I do well? What do I want to learn more about? What do I know about research? And why is that a good career choice for me? And finally, what are my career expectations? Where do I want to be in five years or 10 years? Sort of second order questions are, how can I show that I finish what I start? How can I show that I'm creative? How can I show that I can overcome adversity and persist when the going gets tough? How can I show they have an aptitude for physics or material science or electrical engineering or whatever it is you're, uh, whatever field you're applying in? How can I show that I, that I really understand that discipline and that I understand what research is like and I know what it takes to be successful in research? Uh, and finally, how can I show that, that I will be successful, that the investment, this graduate program or this REU, REU program or this internship, uh, the, that investment will pay off for the company or the program. Uh, one paradigm that is often used in statements of purpose are called, is called the CAR uh, paradigm. And it's you, you lay out your argument in, the term of, in terms of what was the challenge that you faced, what action did you take, and what was the result. And by thoughtfully choosing a couple of examples of this car paradigm, you can show that you finish what you start, that you learn on the job, and that you uh, take responsibility for self-learning because that's a lot of what you'll do in graduate school. Uh, and that you can apply yourself and get measurable results. Um, the, the, another thing about this car paradigm that I think it makes it useful, particularly for graduate admissions committees for what they're looking for, is they want to know how you think. They want to know how you uh, tackle a problem. And um, what, what you do when you have a problem to solve. And how do you think about it? How do you think about what actions to take? Uh, and what are your results? Uh, the kinds of examples you want to use to share with your graduate admissions committee are, ex are examples of things that show that you were resourceful, that you were creative, and that you persisted in getting to a positive con conclusion. Um, it's important to be specific in your uh, statement of purpose. Don't be vague and overly general. Be specific, provide concrete examples, meaningful details. And finally, explicitly state what you've learned or contributed. Uh, if you're describing a research project that you worked on, describe not only what the problem was and the methods you used, but also what did you contribute to solving that problem? What was, what was your, your part in this larger research enterprise? Um, as we saw on the uh, consider your audience statement, one of the things you need to do is grab your audience in the first paragraph and make them want to keep reading. Uh, in the newspaper business, this is called a lead. It's that, that first sentence or two in a newspaper story that makes you want to keep reading and finding out more about the story. Uh, and these are some uh, examples of leads that students have, uh, my students have written, that I think uh, differentiate them from other people, the other 700 applicants, and make a graduate admissions committee want to keep reading and finding out more about this, this student. Um, one example I like to uh, use is uh, probably before you were all born, there was a television program called ER. And it was set in a big Chicago uh, hospital 
in the um, emergency department. And it was a, a ensemble cast. Uh, you know, every week you found out the latest trials and tribulations of the people that worked in the ER. And one particularly memorable uh, episode had Dr. Benton, who was the quintessential arrogant surgeon, had gotten in trouble with Dr. Romano, who was the equally arrogant chief of staff. And so to publish or to punish uh, Benton, Romano made him interview all of the third year medical students who were applying for a residency at this hospital. And so the scene proceeded with Benton sitting behind a desk and there was a tall stack of manila folders on one side of the desk and just a few manila folders on the other side of the desk. And in this sort of time-lapse photography, this pile goes down and this pile goes up and sitting across from the across from Benton, across from the desk, is just this continual um, parade of earnest young medical students. And it started out with an African-American woman in a white coat telling Benton she wanted to be a doctor so she could help people. Next person, Asian male, who ever since he was six years old, wanted to be a doctor so he could help people. Next, white male. Well, he decided he wanted to be a doctor so he could help people. And as they have about 20 of these students going along in this, as I said, kind of time-lapse photography, all of whom are saying they want to be a doctor so they can help people. Benton is sliding farther and farther and farther and farther and farther under his desk. And so think about your admissions committee that is reading 700 applications and every one starts out with, I wanna be a physicist to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Think about starting out something other than you wanna be a physicist because you wanna unravel the mysteries of the universe. Of the 700 applications, at least 650 have started out with exactly those words. So think about how you can set yourself apart from those other folks when you start out your first paragraph. Um, oops. Now, once you've sort of thought about this, you've answered the questions, you've got a strong lead, You've made yourself an outline of the points that you want to, want to have contained in your st statement of purpose. Now you're ready to start writing a first draft. Use the answers to your questions to identify the important points you want to make in your statement of purpose. Then arrange these points in an outline that tells a logical, coherent, persuasive story about you. Make sure your outline conforms to the prompt for that particular position or that particular uh, grad application. Um, some graduate applications have very specific instructions on what they want to see in your uh, statement of purpose. Others are pretty free form and just sort of, you know, write something and tell us about yourself. Uh, so, so be sure that you, your, um, your first draft conforms to those instructions. Um, many of the personal statements are uh, length limited in terms of the number of words, the number of uh, pages that you can have to conform to. And be sure that you, that you do comply with those requirements. Um, if uh, an application doesn't specify a length for your personal statement, I would say in general, you wanna keep it to two pages or less. Remember that poor old professor that's sitting there reading 60 applications tonight. Um, once you've sort of got your outlines of the points you wanna make, fill in the outline with real sentences 
and then let it sit for a while. Uh, give it to um, a graduate student in your group or your advisor or um, another person in the department and ask them to read it and give you feedback on it. And then revise based on the feedback that you get. Um, give your statement to your advisor to read and ask specifically for constructive criticism. And then finally, keep revising. Um, the probability that you're gonna write a acceptable first draft is pretty remote. Uh, and you should write your statement of purpose with the expectation that you're gonna revise it maybe many times uh, until you, you get it logical, coherent, and persuasive. And then finally, repeat steps six and seven. Um, in your statement of purpose, you wanna talk about your, both your short and long-term career goals, and you wanna be specific. Um, how is this particular internship or this particular REU experience or this particular grad school going to prepare you to achieve your short and long-term goals? Uh, some uh, examples of short-term goals would be um, you want to uh, get some experience teaching because it, for most of you, your first year or maybe even your first two years of graduate school, you'll be supported by being a teaching assistant. Uh, and so you should expect to do some teaching. And believe me, graduate programs like ours that have huge service teaching load, we want people who can teach and are excited about teaching and want to learn how to be good teachers. Um, Short-term goal would be to learn more about a particular field of physics. Uh, it could be to join a research group and start to uh, become a part of the group and go to the group meetings and read papers, do a literature review, uh, and get yourself ready to become an active researcher. So here are some ex other examples of short-term goals. You want to explore one or two subfields of physics in greater depth than what you've had uh, exposure to in your undergraduate career. You want to settle on a thesis topic and find an advisor. Uh, you want to take some classes, uh, get familiar with the literature, um, learn new theoretical approaches or new experimental techniques, and finally polish your communications and teaching skills. Um, some examples of longer term goals where you want to be in 10 years are maybe you want to research new semiconducting materials in an industrial lab or become a professor at a, uni at a university or join a high tech company to manufacture sensors to detect fissile materials. Uh, maybe you want to become a quantitative analyst, analyst in um, the insurance industry or the financial services industry. Uh, maybe you want to contribute to the nation's energy independence by doing research at one of our national labs. Um, maybe you want to design new biocompatible materials for uh, biomedicine. But you want to have some specific goals in mind. And one thing that you'll note about these examples that I've given you is they're pretty specific. And the more you can make your statement specific and quantitative, the better. Um, you don't necessarily have to actually pursue any of these goals, but you need to show that you've thought about this uh, seriously and that um, graduate studies at this university are going to prepare you to be successful in these long-term goals. Um, accentuate the positive 
and showcase your problem solving and your communication skills in your statement of purpose. Uh, explicitly say why you're, what makes you a particularly strong prospect for this graduate program? What, what will you bring to the party? Um, have you had to overcome any unusual obstacles in your undergraduate studies that have contributed to your maturity or your intellectual growth or your mental toughness? Um, and finally, don't use slang. Uh, you want to convey, you don't have to be stuffy, but you want to convey that you're a serious person and you're a serious professional and the investment uh, that the graduate program or the company makes in, in you will pay off in the future. Um, uh, just a quick question. Uh, yes. It's probably silly, but uh, could we use nope, acronyms to have explained before what it is? Pardon me, I, I'm sorry, I was talking and I didn't hear your question. Oh, sorry. Uh, I said, could we use acronyms if we've explained before what the term stands for? So say standard model. So could we just say SM uh, for the rest of your statement if we've explained before what SM is? Okay, I'm sorry. You're breaking up a little bit and I'm having trouble understanding you. Could you Let type me see if I could chat it. Uh, yeah, it could you chat. type it into the chat? Yeah. Thank you. Let's see. <laughs> could we use my glass? Sorry. Uh, the connection is probably not very good. Oh, can you use acronyms? As yes, long as yes. you define them the first time. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm sorry. I it just wasn't picking up on acronyms at all. But okay, okay yes. no worries. Yeah, um, sure, you can use acronyms, but always define them first. Yeah. And the first time you use them, define them, write out, write out in words, and then in parentheses after the written words, put the acronym. And then once you've defined it, you can use the acronym again and again. Okay, okay. so um, another thing that you want to do in your statement of purpose is use positive language and action verbs. No wishing or trying or hoping. Say what you're going to do. And yes, there's some uncertainty in that, but you want to be, you have to be positive to be persuasive. And Master Yoda was right. Either do or do not, there is no try. So be positive uh, in your statement. What about deficiencies? That low grade in subatomic particles or disastrous GRE scores or that one semester you partied too hard or a GPA that maybe isn't as good as you wished it would be. Um, how do you address that? And George Washington is right. It's better to offer no excuse than a bad one. Uh, and what I usually rec recommend to students is if it's so egregious that somebody has got to address it, it's often better to have your letter writers do it than for you to explain that bad grade in subatomic phys physics. If you try to explain it, it just sounds like an excuse. But if you talk it over with your letter writers and your letter writer can say, you know, Samantha had trouble, struggled with subatomic physics uh, because that was the semester she was ill and missed a number of classes. Um, I don't think her grade in that class at all reflects her capabilities. And if you have your letter writer say that, the, you know, it's coming from an objective person and a letter writer can explain that, uh, which if you say it, it just sounds like you're making an excuse. And, you know, if your grades were lower in your freshman and sophomore classes, I think uh, admissions committees and HR people realize that for some people, the adjustment of first semester or two at a university is hard. 
until you get sort of your time management down and your self-discipline in full swing, um, they will be more critical of bad grades in your junior and senior years. And uh, this is, again, something that you need to talk over with your advisor. Or um, for those of you who are in physics in our department, uh, talk it over with Marissa uh, Milton, the academic advisor, and she, she'll give you good advice. Um, the other thing that's really important to do is sort of map your interests and strengths to the, the job or the RU program or the graduate school that you're applying to. You want to show that you've thoughtfully and thoroughly investigated what's involved in this opportunity. You found that it fits your interests and your goals and you've planned how you will succeed in that position. Um, to repeat, your statement of purpose must be separately tuned to each program that you're applying for. Sending identical statements of purpose to different programs or companies is just a re recipe for disaster. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a, an example from one of my former students uh, who was applying for uh, a graduate program at the University of Texas, Austin. And he wanted to go into computational physics. And so he, he wrote his statement of purpose about why he wanted to be a computational physicist and why he thought he'd be a good computational physicist. But he never once mentioned the Texas Advanced Computation Center, which is the, the supercomputer equivalent of NCSA at the University of Texas. And the Texans are very proud of their supercomputers and they had just launched a new one. And you know, I sort of <laughs> took him aside and said, Scott, flip on your brights here. You've got to say something about the Texas Advanced Com Computational Center if you want to be a computational physicist at the University of Texas. And so with that sort of tactless prodding, he did go in and really learn a lot about the hardware and the software at the Texas Advanced Computational Center and wrote just, he just nailed his application to University of Texas. And he got in and he's now a PhD from computational physicist from the University of Texas, Austin. But that's the sort of thing that you need to do some investigation about. If you're applying to the University of Illinois, you want to, in uh, experimental condensed matter physics, you've got to talk about the MRL and the the research infrastructure that's provided to computational condensed matter physics at the University of Illinois. If you're interested in, in computational physics and you're applying to the University of Illinois, you've got to mention uh, NCSA and the, the facilities that are available at NCSA. And you know, every, every research university has got some kind of special infrastructure uh, for a graduate student to take advantage of. And you need to do enough of your homework so that you know what, what that infrastructure is and how to mention it in your statement of purpose. Here's an example. Um, I'm interested in optical communications and networks. During my senior year, I worked with Professor Jim Eckstein who was developing an all optical frequency shifter that employs a microwave source phase lock to the optical pulse repetition rate. I believe that the applied and engineering physics program at Cornell would offer an ideal environment for me to expand these interests. And then you mentioned particularly, Professor Pollock is doing interest, is doing work on the interaction of short pulses with fiber optic devices. And you show that you have investigated the program, you thought about who you might work with at Cornell, you know uh, how this fits in to your own interests and your own experience. And it gives the admissions committee at Cornell some reassurance that 
you're going to fit into their program and you're probably going to be successful. On the other hand, you don't want to box yourself in. Um, you want to mention two or three professors at the target department that you would be interested in working in. You want to relate those opportunities, what you've done in the past, but you want to leave yourself open that to the idea that you're adaptable, you're flexible, and you're willing to uh, look at other opportunities. Um, for our graduate programs admission, we require students to indicate whether they're interested in theory or experiment and what sort of broad field of physics are they interested in, AMO, bio, condensed matter, and so on. Uh, and we make admissions decisions based on what students tell us in their applications. But about a third of the graduate students who end up getting PhDs from our department get their PhD in some field other than what they checked off on their grad admissions um, application. So uh, graduate program directors understand that uh, you may not necessarily um, pursue that, that subfield. Um, but you need to show that you're, you, you can be flexible and that you'll consider uh, other options. Um, I, I remember uh, helping one student with his uh, grad school uh, statements of purpose, and he wanted to go to Princeton. And so he wrote a statement of purpose for Princeton and he said that he wanted to work with Philip Anderson, which is fine. He wanted to do condensed matter theory. Philip Anderson is probably one of our most prominent US condensed matter theorists. But at the time, Philip Anderson was 93 years old. And again, it was like, you know, okay here, <laughs> you can say this in your statement of purpose, but people are, Princeton that read this are going to say, Philip Anderson's 93 years old. He's not going to take this kid as a graduate student. Let's admit somebody else. Um, always have your advisor review, uh, your advisor or professor review their statement of purpose for physics accuracy. Don't write anything about physics or your research that you do not thoroughly understand and that your advisor checks. Um, as we talked about with writing a strong lead, you want to set yourself apart from the crowd, but do it prudently and tastefully. Um, finally, really polish your writing. Uh, make sure that you're expressing yourself lucidly, elegantly, and concisely. But the likelihood of the spontaneous appearance of these effects approaches zero in a first draft. You're going to have to write with the expectation that you'll rewrite. So for some final advice, write a core document about you and about your experiences, and then modify that to fit the particular program that you're applying to. Um, don't underestimate the time required. This is a lot of work. And if you wait until after the semester is over and start writing frantically grad school applications that are due December the 15th, you're not going to have a good outcome. So get started early, think about it, revise. In particular, line up your letter writers early. Um, now is not too late, or is not too early. In fact, it's probably a little bit late. Um, so. Um, Get your letter writers uh, lined up early, uh, tell them, give them the list of schools that you're applying to, uh, make sure they understand what the deadline is for them to get their letters in, uh, tell them how they're supposed to submit the letters. If it's, they're supposed to go to an online form and upload a letter, if they're supposed to email the letter, if they're supposed to send a hard copy of the letter, make sure that they know exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, and then I usually recommend people uh, 
if you're you're going to apply to Cornell and you think you are interested in working with Seamus Davis, tell that to your letter writers. Chances are the letter writer knows Seamus Davis and can write a more targeted personal letter on your behalf if you know if the the letter writer knows who whom you want to work with. Um, if external letters are required and they're always required, get them lined up early. Proofread everything more than once from a hard copy. Your statement of purpose has to be perfect. And Americans are funny. American ac academics are funny. Uh, we think that if there's a typo in something like a statement of purpose, it means you're a careless person and you don't have sufficient attention to detail to be a good physicist. And for those of you who do not speak or write English as a first language, that's probably unfair. It's probably unjust. It's probably colonial imperialism, but that's just the way we are. And so make sure you don't have anything that a critical American would think is a careless error in your statement of purpose. Um, there are a couple of tricks for proofreading. Um, first of all, print out a hard copy of your statement of purpose and proofread the hard copy. Something very magical happens when you have a piece of paper in your hands. You will see mistakes on paper that you are completely oblivious to on the screen. Um, while you're proofreading, use your finger to underline each sentence as you read it. That will slow you down and make you look at each word individually. And you'll see things that way that you won't see otherwise. Um, old copy editor's trick is if it has to be perfect, you print it out on hard copy. And then instead of starting at the upper left-hand corner and reading from left to right, you start in the lower right-hand corner at the bottom and read backwards. And that forces you to look at each word individually. And you'll see mistakes that, again, you, don't, you just don't see when you're reading the way you normally read. Uh, and finally, end with a bang. Uh, include a summary paragraph that reiterates your desire to attend that program, uh, recaps your uh, preparation to be successful in that program, and um, gives, gives the reader the last impression of, boy, this is somebody that we should admit to our program. And that's about everything I know about a statement of purpose. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and answer any questions that you have. Again, if you would like to ask your question in the chat box, I am moderating that so I can ask it for you. Um, I, I do have a question if no one has a question right now. Okay, sure. Uh, what percent of the document your of the statement of purpose document should be considered like core? All your all of your description of your research experience. Um, your lead will probably be be the same for all the documents. Your description of your research experience will be pretty much the same for each of the documents. It's the part um, for, uh, you know, how, how you match up with different faculty and different resources at the university, at a specific university that will be different. Um, next question, how different are personal statements from statements of purpose? I tend to use the words interchangeably. They, they're probably describe the same document. Um, some graduate programs ca call them statements of purpose, some call them personal statements. Um, some ask you to write two. One is your personal statement that is sort of the, the characteristics that you bring 
to graduate school that, that will make you be successful. Um, and a, a research statement that is more a description of your uh, research experience and your expectations for what kind of research you want to do in graduate school. Um, there are, uh, I've found out this year that Berkeley is asking for a personal statement. They, Berkeley used to call this a diversity statement. And this is just wild speculation on my part. I do not know this for certain. But I think what they're, they're trying to get at is to have you self-identify if you are a member of a mi minority group. They can't legally ask you if you're a member of a minority group, but if they can get you to self-identify as one, uh, then every graduate school is trying to diversify its, its student body. Uh, we are all under um, incentives from federal funding agencies, uh, moral imperatives to open up the field to people who have traditionally been shut out of physics. And uh, if, if you are a member of a minority group, uh, the, the schools that you are applying to want to know that because um, that factors into their admissions decisions. And again, whether that's right or wrong or just, just I could argue both ways, but it's it's a fact. So you said they removed their diversity statement and are instead calling it a personal statement? They're calling it a personal statement this year, you know. I think, at least from a couple of the students that I've talked to that have come and asked me, you know, what's this personal statement supposed to be? And, and the prompt is very definite uh, that that's what they're getting after. If you're a member of an underrepresented group, if you're a first generation uh, graduate student, if you're from a uh, socioeconomic distressed class, that's what they're asking you to write about. Uh, also, uh, uh, I just have a question about something that was uh -huh. on one of your previous slides. So when we we're talking about the uh, car paradigm, uh -huh. you mentioned that we have to be specific about the methods we're using in our research or you know, how, how uh -huh. you basically did your research. And I was wondering how specific is too specific or uh, would it hurt if we're being vague? Like where's this balance between being specific and being vague? Yeah. Um, you, well, the Graduate Admissions Committee doesn't need to know where you set the knob on your experimental apparatus. Um, they're looking more at, you know, what project did you do? What methods did you use? Um, what did you contribute to this project? Uh, and, you know, for our department, we have a committee that reads all of our applications. And, you know, they're from every subfield of physics that we have in our department. So you may get one of the biological physicists reading your application if you want to come to U of I to study astrophysics. And so, you know, they're PhD physicists, very experienced, um, but they may not know all of the really fine details of what you did as an astrophysicist. Uh, this is something where I think your advisor can really help you. Uh, if you have a question about, is this specific enough? Is this too specific? Um, ask your advisor. Thank you. One of the things I love about my job is about 99.999% of the questions I am asked I can answer with it depends. <laughs> so it it just kind of depends. Uh, any other questions from anybody? There's a question in the chat. 
from Kunal. He is asking, should I talk about the, paper, the research paper I will publish in a couple of months that might not be ready before deadlines? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, say that you're preparing, uh, you're preparing a manuscript that will be submitted. If you know what journal it's going to be submitted to, give the name of the journal. Uh, if you're far enough along that you've got a title and you've got co-authors, uh, cite it as a reference, just like you would cite any other reference and give the, the author's names, the title, uh, the name of the journal, and then mark it to be submitted or in preparation. But yes, uh, uh, publications are the scalps we count in evaluating people's research productivity. So if you've got a, a manuscript that in preparation, uh, certainly you can talk about it. And uh, one last question for me. Uh -huh. uh, when we were discussing the outline to the statement of focus, uh, I was just wondering if there was like a recommended way to organize your ideas, say, you know, talk about research first or talk about your skills or any other you know grad classes you've taken or mm -hmm. uh, computational skills or you know how to organize these things and if there's a recommended way of doing it right um the statements of purpose that i've seen are usually uh ordered chronologically so you describe the first research uh project that you worked on and what you did in sort of chronological order and then the second research experience if you have more than one. Um, I think it's, it's helpful to tie skills that you've learned to the description of the research program or the research project that you worked on. So uh, you, you worked on this project, you learned how to use a lock-in amplifier and uh, you learned uh, how to take data uh, you learned how to uh, operate an atomic force microscope and take data. Um, you use these computer programs to analyze your data um, and, and so on. So it, it's sort of a um, blend of, you know, this is the project, this is what I learned, this is what I contributed to the project. Any other questions for anybody? Let me put my email address in the chat if you think of a question tomorrow. Just send me an email. <laughs>